All right, so welcome everybody. Thanks for coming here today, and I hope that you are appreciating this Booster Summit conference. I definitely are I'm learning a lot with the uh, uh, the speakers so far, so I hope you are enjoying as well. So uh, this session, we are going to kind of deviate a little bit about the uh, the focus on the broker and the architecture of the Pulsar per se, and we're going to focus on on what developers are usually focused on on their daily job, which is reading and writing data to Pulsar. Right to and from Pulsar. So, the title of this presentation I call uh, "Down to the Rabbit Roll" because the whole intention here is to not only provide you with a proper understanding about how Pulsar IO works, but also how can you actually master this framework so you can accomplish uh, your job of like, ingesting and uh, sending data from Pulsar to other systems very effectively. So, at least this is what I'm hoping to. Uh, just to like, uh, I think the better way to understand what Pulsar IO is, is to recap about what Pulsar actually does, which is uh, if you look to the, I'm sorry, uh, if you look to Pulsar, you're going to see that it is going to be this huge pipe, extremely scalable, extremely resilient, that is meant to be a store for data streams, right? So this is what fundamentally Apache Pulsar does, but at the same at the time that you have streams stored there, you can send those streams like and process them and via other systems and other func other functionalities, right? So this is fundamentally what Pulsar does. Um, okay. And then the Pulsar IO framework is going to be the plumbing part, right? So it's going to be that framework that you are going to use to both do the ingestion of data into Pulsar, right? So the whole objective is to read data from sources and then bring this data in into Pulsar so the data streams can, can be stored, right, durably and reliably. And by the time you have those data streams stored, you can send them somewhere else as well. So the Pulsar IO framework uh, allows you to do this. And uh, the whole concept of Pulsar IO is giving you the flexibility of doing this using connectors, right? So there's a considerable amount of connectors pre created. We're going to discuss some of them later. But the fundamental part that you have to understand here is that the Pulsar IO framework is going to be your in and out framework, right? So uh, I would say that uh, Pulsar IO has a special place in the heart of developers because. In my opinion, in my experience, I think by the time you, you have the Pulsar brokers and bookkeeper and zookeeper, the whole architecture up and running effectively, right? Everything else is going to boil down to read and write data, right? And I, I, I think developers sometimes kind of uh, don't give the proper attention to that part because there's a lot of complexity that uh, has to do with this. For example, uh, CG uh, was discussing a couple of minutes ago about the whole concept of how Pulsar handles transaction, right? So if, you, if you're building an application that has to very durably and handle uh, right data into Pulsar using the concept of transactions, so this itself is a problem, obviously, Pulsar supports, but what's, how does it look like for the developer standpoint to handle transaction? What their application has to deal with this? And this is the part where I think it is important. And uh, here's, here's another bummer as well, right? At, at least in my experience, right? Uh, Pulsar, it is this uh, like extremely scalable, amazing technology that people are love to use in their in their projects. And by the time they have this done, usually what you, they have to interface is with some backend systems that are not so strong and durable and scalable as Pulsar is. Right. So. What I'm trying to say is that sometimes you are basically using Pulsar, which is this bazooka, right? And pointing to a very fragile backend system that, right, perhaps it does, it only supports like a five messages per second. That's the maximum throughput before you start slowing down the, the backend system. So it, it is very frequent for, for you to be in a project where, right, yeah, uh, I think everything else is just going down. And usually, uh, the the middleware part is what to blame, right? So people that take care on the back end, they're gonna say, yeah, no, the back end here is fine. Everything is running effectively here, and it should be definitely a problem on the Pulsar side of things, which is, in my experience, is not always true, right? I think 
Pulsar does what it does very effectively, but usually the problem is on the back end, right? Obviously, it's not 100% of the time, but I would say that 80% of the time, the back end is not very, very well like designed as uh, Pulsar is. So I think because of this, you got to have a proper understanding about what Pulsar IO or how it works, why it works, the way it works, and what's going to be the tools that you have to understand in order to have, uh, in order to do full uh, usage of this framework. So, with that said, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Ricardo Ferreira, and I'm a work as a developer advocate for this company called Elastic. You might have heard about Elastic for the Elastic Stacks, which is composed by technologies such as Elasticsearch, which is a NoSQL database. Um, there's Logstash, Beats, and Kibana, and pretty much all the technology that uh, developers usually use for observability and logging purposes, right? And before Elastic, I used to work for other vendors as well, such as Confluent, where I started this kind of a little passion of mine uh, with streaming systems. Uh, back then, I obviously, I was working with Kafka, and then that's where I discovered Pulsar. And before that, Oracle and Red Hat, which I didn't have an exposure to streaming systems per se, but my background all involves about you working with messaging technology. But my career itself has all been about uh, data IO, like uh, moving data from one place to another using messaging or streaming systems, right? Back here, I brought my emails, both for an Elastic and for my personal email. So if you ever want to talk about any of those technologies over here, feel free to it. And if you happen to use Twitter, you can find me on at Riferay, right? So my DMs are open, and for those of you that know me, I'm a open book. I love to talk about technology with everybody else. Right. So with that said, uh, let's skip the introductions for, for for now, and let's talk business. Right. So the agenda for today, right? Uh, we have roughly 30 minutes, right, to cover what we need to cover, and I'm gonna try to spend about 10 minutes on each one of those bullets. Right. So the first one. We're going to spend some time understanding the architecture of Pulsar IO. I think this is extremely important, right? Because uh, at least this this worked for me. By the time I understood the architecture behind Pulsar IO, everything else was so easy to understand, right? So do not skip that part. Even if you skip this whole presentation and what later, but if you want to, uh, you want to try to learn by yourself. Focus on the fundamentals because they matter, right? Uh, and then we're going to discuss something about installing and managing the connectors. I'm going to give you some overview about where to find the connectors, how to install them, how to verify if they are working. And then we are going to discuss some troubleshooting and debugging techniques, where if you end up on time, uh, I would like, to, this is my intention for today, I would like to do a real live debugging exercise with you for, for one of the connectors. So you can see how to do this because probably you're gonna to need to have this expertise for your daily day jobs, right? So let's start by understanding the Pulsar architecture, right? So I think the best way to uh, explain the Pulsar IO architecture is to look like a lasagna, right? Uh, luckily, my presentation was not a lunch time, at least for a Pacific time. So nobody of you, I, at least this is, I believe, is not hungry anymore because if you look to this picture, right, you feel like a, into uh, having a lasagna right now, right? At least that happens with me. But focus on the point. Uh, if you look for a Pulsar connector, which is the building block that you're going to work with Pulsar IO, right? Pulsar connectors sit on top of something called Pulsar functions, right? We have heard a lot about Pulsar, Pulsar function at this point, right? Uh, if you uh, watch it, the keynotes in the morning, and then some of the presentation for the deep dive or this morning, you would see that Pulsar functions perform a huge and important role in the Pulsar architecture because they are the layer that actually do the processing, right? So every time you want to do some processing, uh, at least if you're not planning to use some other frameworks such as Apache Flink, you're going to end up using Pulsar function, right? A connector is nothing else than an implementation on top of Pulsar functions, right? So keep that in mind. And Pulsar functions, in turn, are some implementations that you're going to run in something called a functions worker, right? So every the runtime part of where you're going to run some Pulsar functions calls functions worker. So keep that in mind, OK? If we recap the programming model of a given Pulsar function, it is, it is extremely simple, right? You're going to have some input topics, right? that your function is going to pull messages from, right? 
And then there will be some processing that will be expressed by the logic that you can write using the many programming languages that are supported by pulsar functions. And then ultimately, you are going to produce one or multiple outputs, right? And those outputs can be sent to the same or multiple topics, right? So this is fundamentally what a pulsar function does, right? There, there might be some intermediate processing such as logging all the, uh, everything that's going on into a, let's call a wiretap topic some for logging purposes, but ultimately you're gonna have input and output and then the intermediate processing, right? If you look what a source connector is, a source connector is kind of a, a version of a function that pretty much read data from sources, not necessarily topics, right? That's why I highlighted here only the part that matters. So the function itself has been written to read data from, let's say, a database or let's say a message broker such as RepMQ, right? And then once those messages or data, right? At the time, we're, we're calling them records, right? At the time those records are in the pulsar function, is going to, they're going to process them, they're going to convert them into the proper messages, and then the source connector job is to write them off into a topic. So by that time, the information is written as a data stream in a pulsar topic, right? So this is a source connector. If you look, for example, what is the implementation of a source connector behind scenes, you're going to see that it is going to be an interface that uh, extend out of closable, and then the source interface has these two methods. The, the open method, that where you're gonna write how you specify, establish a connection with the source uh, system, and then you are going to essentially perform reads that needs to return records, right? It is your responsibility to instantiate the records, right? Out of the system that you were reading. And what about the sync connector, right? The sync connector has the opposite responsibility. So the sync, is fundamentally reading the existing data that is sitting on topics, data streams per se, and then they're going to do some transformation, some adaptation in the layout or the format, and their job is to send this data somewhere else. Whether this somewhere else can be maybe uh, another pulsar cluster or some database or some S3 object store sitting in AWS, who knows, right? The job of the sync is to write data off to external systems, right? But ultimately, if you got the gist here, uh, both the source and sync connectors sit on top of a pulsar function, right? And this is the uh, the anatomy of a sync connector, right? Basically, you're gonna have also the method open to establish the connection with this target system. And then, instead of actually uh, instantiating the record, the records will be given to you as a parameter, right? So you don't have to do nothing to actually build up the record. The, your job is to grab those records and writing them off into the target system, no matter what the target system is, right? So it is extremely simple, right? So records are your unit of work, right? So this is what you're going to use to pretty much perform jobs with source and sync connectors, right? The only difference is that in a source connector, it is the developer's job to build up the record and send the data in. And the sync connector, it is responsibility to receive the records because the data is available already, right? And writing them off, right? So you might have this kind of a division of responsibility, whether if you are writing a sync or source connectors, right? All right, and I've mentioned that functions uh, basically execute on top of something called a function worker. So there are two ways for you to execute a function worker. Either you are going to execute them side by side with your brokers, option number one, probably the most common one if you are in the development mode, or you can create your own cluster of function workers that are gonna be executed along with your brokers, right? So there are two options, right? It's always good to have options, right? Running along with the brokers, what is the advantage of this? Less clusters to manage, it's simpler, right? What is the problem of this? You're going to compete processing power, CPU, memory, and network with what the broker has to do, right? So now, uh, remember, a Pulsar I.O. is something that's going to incur a lot in CPU, memory, and network activity. So likely in a production environment, you don't want to have this competition of resources. You want to have like resource isolation. So it's better to separate, right? Uh, which is the case of running when they're on cluster. So what is the advantage? It's going to be right-sized. So you will, won't have like questions like, ah, oh, yeah, I'm not sure why my CPUs are so high on my brokers. And I don't know if this is for the, what, Pulsar brokers are doing or for the connector. So you don't have this question anymore because now they're separate. However, 
you're going to have like trade-offs about complexity and simplicity of management because now you're going to end up with more clusters to manage, right? And if you want to uh, run the uh, uh, worker, right? I'm <laughs> sorry, worker along with the brokers. Pretty much, what you have to do is in the broker conf file, you have to dis you have to enable the workers in the, uh, the function worker and the broker, right? By default, is disabled, so keep that in mind. And then you have to go to this functions worker.yaml file and set up some properties that basically will dictate the runtime configuration and where the logs of the give, that given function worker will be stored and things like that, and where the connectors and functions will be picked up from, right, in the directories, right? And if you want to check if they're working or not, basically you can invoke this endpoint over here, slash admin v2 worker cluster, and then you would end up with something like this. It means that your broker has a function worker up and running, right? Otherwise, it's not working. If you want to ro uh, run in their own cluster, basically what you have to do in the broker, have to disable the, the function workers. Don't forget to do this if you once enable for true. And then in the function worker YAML, you're going to end up configuring the same properties, but with some additional one, because now each worker has to have their own ID, host name, port, et cetera, et cetera, right? And you also have an endpoint to check if everything is working or not. There is a special case, let's call it edge case, where, it, because think about this, now if you separate your brokers and function worker clusters, now the admin interface has to know how to serve certain requests. Like, because if a developer is kind of issuing some requests via the uh, pull source CLI, right? How the admin, how the CLI is gonna know about, okay, I'm gonna grab this information from the fu function workers cluster or for the broker cluster. So that can be easily, easily, is kind of a hard work, easily solved by spinning up uh, what we call a proxy cluster, right? So it is something that you have to create yourself, manage, right? And this link over here, you have the instruction about how to build one but the proxy is going to be responsible for how to write the proper admin request to the proper cluster, right? So there is a way to fix this. And finally, we're gonna cover this in the end. Uh, functions runtime has three configurations, right? By default, any function or connector that you spin up is gonna, gonna become a process on the operating system, right? This is the default, we call it process runtime, right? But there's another option to run this uh, of runtime, which is the thread runtime. So. In a given JVM, which is your function worker or broker, each connector is going to be executed in a thread, right? Obviously, it's not very scalable, good for debugging purposes. Or if you're running Kubernetes, you can actually you spin up one or multiple stateful sets that's going to represent one instance of your connector, right? So this is pretty much how it works, right? And finally, also part of the runtime configuration, there is something if you are running on Docker and Kubernetes, you can specify when you are creating the connector resources such as the, the amount of RAM and disk and CPU, right? Which is, can become pretty handy for you to find and control the resources that are being used by a given Pulsar worker clusters or broker clusters, right? So that said, let's talk now how we can actually grab our hands into a given connector, right? Because everything is about connectors, right? So I think the first thing you have to do is understanding that uh, there are two types of connectors, the built-in ones, the ones that comes with Apache Pulsar, and there will be ones that the community build, or, or perhaps you build, you wrote the connector, right? That we call custom connectors, right? As I mentioned before, there's a bunch of pre-built connectors, so where are you gonna find them? As well as any community build connectors, the best way to do this is going to rub dot stream native dot io right this is as the name implies it is a hub for not only connectors but for a lot of other technologies that pulsar supports such as offloaders protocol handlers logging and monitoring uh, applications so keep that in mind i think that's the best place to find your connectors and i like it stream hub uh because not only it provides you with the connectors, the .nar files, but also gives you configuration samples, which can become pretty handy to understand what, pro what properties to set for a connector, right? The other place where to find the connectors in the Pulsar website per se, right? Like Pulsar.apache.org. And then there will be also a session there where you can see all the connectors, you can download the NAR files, and you would have like kind of, kind of examples about how to build them as well, right? Uh, since the, the folks that build Pulsar also happens to be probably some of the folks that work for Stream Native, 
most likely the Pulsar website is going to be in sync with the stream native I.O. So that's good for consistency, right? Uh, so my recommendation, if you are in development, and specifically if you are using Docker, try to use this image called Pulsar uh, All, right? Because most of the examples that you're going to see from Docker out there is not using this image, but this is the image that includes all the built-in connectors. So this is good for troubleshooting purposes because most of the time, if you're spinning up a Docker container with a Pulsar and you want to try one of the connectors, you want to make sure that the connectors are actually available in the image. Or you can actually, still in developing, kind of a spin up the connectors using something called local run, right? I'm going to talk about this later. In production, there's no way out. You have to install the connectors on each broker or slash each one of the function workers that you have configured in your cluster, right? And likely there will be a bunch of NAR files in a folder called slash connectors, right? It doesn't have to be slash connectors. You can configure in that in that file function slash worker dot yaml the exact location, but by um, by default, this is the, the name of the the folder that's going to pick up the, the, the files from. All right. Regardless if you are using the Docker all image, the Pulsar all image, or if you install all the connectors manually in each one of the brokers or Pulsar workers, how do you ensure that the, the either the function worker and the broker are loading them up, right? So you can call the CLI, Pulsar admin, sources and then available sources. You would end up with a list of all the connectors that the broker or function worker was able to load up, right? So this is a handy way for you to check if something is off, right? For example, oh, uh, presumably I had three connectors deployed, but it only listed two. So what happened with the third, right? So that type of thing that you can verify with this command line. Same goes for syncs, pulsar admin syncs, available things. So this is kind of a way for you to check if your sync connectors are in place, right? And this is the, like, if you're in development, of course, there, there are some situations in production that is probably for troubleshooting that you can use this. But for development, if, you, if this is going to be the first time that you are trying out a connector from Pulsar, my recommendation is to play with the connector using this, call, this CLI called local run, right? So what this does, uh, the name implies like it's going to be a local execution of the connector and it's going to spin up one thread or multiple threads for the number of instances that you specify here, right? So this is going to be kind of a one-off one execution of the connector, right? By the time you hit a command C or control C, it's going to stop everything else and the connector will be no longer running, right? So, so this is not a, a stateful deployment of your connector, right? Excellent for testing studying and troubleshooting purposes, right? Uh, basically, what you have to do is to build up a configuration file in YAML. Pretty much, it's almost like you were deploying, except that's not going to be, it's going to be a real deployment, right? And now, since we are actually, we are on time, we're, this is good, let's talk about some troubleshooting and debugging techniques. But before we do this, let me show you this, right? Let me show you how this local run works. And I brought you here a demo that I would like to share with you today. Um, let me close this, sorry about that. So let me increase the font size because I am pretty sure that's not very visible for you. Should be better now. So what I have here is a elastic step, uh, elastic stack up and running where both Elasticsearch and Kibana so what I'm going to do now is to do a very quick experimentation of deploying a connector and Pulsar. I have Pulsar up and running as well. And then I'm going to deploy an Elasticsearch connector and Pulsar, but using local run. So we can actually send data to Pulsar topics. And this data is going to be replicated to Elasticsearch using this connector, right? So to make sure everything is in place, we don't have any indexes on Elasticsearch at this point, so it is good. So let me do this. Uh, let me increase the font size as well here, right? So here is my configuration file that uh, I'm going to use, right? So basically, I have to specify how to contact Elasticsearch and what index will be used in the Elasticsearch side. So this is my configuration file in the for the Pulsar side of things, right? 
And then I'm going to execute this script over here called look, I call it local run. Let me do this. I think it's going to be easier for you to see. That basically what I'm doing here is to using the admin URL from Pulsar, and then I'm, I'm saying that I'm going to use local run. Uh, I'm specifying here the NAR file from the Elastic Search, the last version, what what uh, tenant and namespace from Pulsar I'm going to use. Uh, you got to give a name for it, right? And specifying the Elasticsearch.yaml file and what topics are going to be used for this uh, for this demonstration. Since this is a sync connector, what topics are going to be used for verifying which data to replicate to Elasticsearch, right? So. With that said, I'm going to execute this local run. Local run. Okay. So as you can see here, the local run is going to uh, do a one-time deployment of the connector, right? Uh, is my broker running? Yeah, it, is, it should be running. So you should see all the deployment uh, logging coming up over here. So it, it is good for troubleshooting purposes. So let me do this. I'm going to open a second window over here. And then I have this script called send one off. Let me show you what the script does. Uh, basically, the script sends a message to this topic called Pulsar Summit. And this is going to be the message. Uh, where is it? It's a one off the JSON. It's a JSON payload, pretty much, right? So I'm going to execute this send one off, right? And then what needs to happen is that the connector should picks up this message from the top, from the pulsar topic and send to Elasticsearch, right? Uh, okay, so the message has been produced, and then we should have some. Yep, we have some topics already over here and some messages being indexed over here. So we can check these messages uh, over here. Yeah, so as you can see here, there are some messages, the X, Y, and Z that we have been producing so far, right? So if I come and see this or control C, right? That's it, I've stopped it, the thread that was uh, instantiated by the rope run. So the connector is no longer running. If I send messages right now, those messages will be just sitting there on the topic, right? We won't be replicated to Elasticsearch. So as I mentioned before, is a great way for you to troubleshoot and Making thing, making sure you understand how the connectors work, right? Because here's the thing: each connector will behave differently, right? You can become extremely uh, knowledgeable in how the Elasticsearch connector work and have no clue about, for example, how the Cassandra connector works. So, the, I think using local run is a good way for you to understand what to do uh, when you are learning for the first time a connector, right? Now let's talk about troubleshooting, right? So troubleshooting is something that nobody wants to talk about it because let's face it, it's not very pleasant, right? But it is something that you have to do. You have to do because uh, in a given point in time, we are dealing here with distributed systems. We are dealing here with uh, moving parts that can fail, right? Because it is all network based. So we need to find ways for actually make sure uh, when things are going well or not, right? So let's talk about what is going to be your first steps to check if a connector is misbehaving, right? So my opinion is that your very first instinct has to has to be running this. Uh, so my pointer is a, with a bit delay here, but yep, here we go. Yeah, your first instinct has to be like running this uh, sync verification where you can flush all the configuration of a given connector. This is good because most of the time you will find out that, oh yeah, it's not working because the is pointing to the wrong Elasticsearch cluster. So you can visually see this if you dump all the configuration, right? This is only gonna work if you have a connector already deployed, right? So this is how you dump the configuration, right? So it is a, it is a way for you to double check if, okay, First things first, all the configuration is correct. It is correct. So you can go to the second option, which is let's check the connector of the status. Sorry, the status of the connector, right? So uh, here's the thing. Uh, Pulsar does, Pulsar IO specifically, does this phenomenal job by managing each connector instance and giving you the life cycle and everything that's going on with the connector behind the scenes. It's a, very effective way for you to see what's going on. And if you call this 
uh, Pulsar admin syncs or source status, you're going to flush the status of a connector, and then you can see things like, uh, oh, yeah, so I can see here that the connector has restarted like 41 times, and the this command will try its best to print out a error message for you, but do not trust on this because here it's pretty simple. Oh, yeah, there's a connection refuses, so probably Elasticsearch is not running, right? But sometimes it won't be so clear as it is because it will try to simply, it is based on Java, right? So we'll try to read the uh, stack uh, exception dot get message from the Java uh, call. So in, it's gonna try to put it here, but sometimes it won't be so convenient like it's here. But the other information that come from this, like uh, the number of exceptions that have occurred, the last received time, for example, oh, so maybe it was working, but you can check here in a timestamp that it stopped from working like five minutes ago. So you can double check what happened five minutes ago. So printing the status is a good way for a check what's going on. If you see that even the status is showing that everything is okay, the other thing you have to do is to check the topic, right? So let's face it, everything in Pulsar IO has to do with topics. If you are dealing with a source connector, it is your job to check, all right, is there any messages being written into a, a Pulsar topic, right? So if no messages are being written into a Pulsar topic, so maybe you can isolate if the problem is the Pulsar broker or function workers, if it is the connector, it's per se, or it maybe is the source system. Same goes to the sync, right? You, you can isolate if it is the broker, the, the function worker, the connector, or the target system, right? So uh, checking the statistics of your Pulsar topics is a way for you to catch up with whatever the connector is doing and whatever is happening with the topics, right? So try to see, for example, yeah, no, I can see here that there are five messages in the Pulsar topic, but there are no messages being written off into Elasticsearch. So yeah, definitely something on the connector layer that's happening, right? Something is blocking it off, right? And obviously, right, uh, all the years that passes by, it nothing replaces the plain good old checking the logs, right? So. Uh, there might be situations where you would have to kind of a SSH into the Pulsar brokers or the nodes that builds up your Pulsar workers, and then you have to kind of a tail the logs and check what's going on. So it is the best way. And ultimately, the logs will be the entity that will tell you what the problem is, right? Because the, all the stack traces, all the errors will explode there, right? The only thing you have to, you have to uh, make sure is that although they're going to be all the logs stored in the same folder. They will be broken down by depending of the tenant, sorry. Yeah, the tenant, the namespace, and the connector name. So there will be this kind of a very unique directory layout that will be created for the uh, function workers framework, right? Uh, and there is something very convenient, right? That the local run utility does, which is, all right, you can specify the number, it, it, it is all, everything is a one-off execution of the connector, right? So, but you can specify how many threads you want to spin up in a given local run. This is very awesome because sometimes the problem, it works, your connector might work with the backend system when you are have one instance running, right? For example, maybe there's some problem related to locking of tables in the backend system. And by the time you spin up two connectors or three connectors or more than one connector, all the tables in the back end seem to start to be locked. So how can you isolate situations like this? You can test your local run connector using this minus minus parallelism and specify a parameter, right? So this is ultimately is going to specify the number of threads that you want to spin up, right? Which is pretty handy, right? Because like I said, sometimes it's a problem of concurrency. And uh, this is kind of a, a technique that I've been using uh, Every time I use Pulsar with sync connectors, right? Which is, right, when I'm unsure that if the messages are leaving, actually leaving Pulsar and effectively going to the backend system, one thing you can do is to use this, uh, it doesn't have to be this one, but there are some proxy technologies that you can use as a wiretap, right? Where you can specify on the function worker or broker from Pulsar that you're going to use that proxy and then all the messages that are going flowing through to the backend is going to basically pass through the proxy. And then you can grab a copy of all these 
network connectivity and check if, oh yeah, so you know what's going on? Uh, the connector is not using the correct endpoint URI of the backend. It expects slash something and is doing slash something else. So it is a way for you to troubleshoot what is the actual payload that is going to be sent downstream, right? So usually you're gonna use this when you are using syncs, but there might be situations that this approach here might work also with sources, right? And also, if you are dealing with multiple clusters and logs from function workers from uh, Apache Pulsar, uh, it's gonna be hard to actually SSH into a given node and do tail, tail minus F to do read the logs. So what you can do is to, yep, five minutes, got it. What you can do is to actually consolidate all your logs into a platform such as Elasticstack, right? So you can use things like a beat to read the data from the sources and then from the brokers and the function workers, and then you consolidate into Elasticsearch and then you can use Kibana to do the tailing of the logs. I think it's more effective and it is a proving technique for you if you have like hundreds of servers and nodes to be managed, right? So. You don't want to SSH in each one of the containers. Uh, right. We have, according to my friend Alice, we have five minutes. So there might be situations where you've checked everything that I've just mentioned, but you still have no idea what to do, right? So in my experience, what you got to do is to kind of uh, pull your sleeves and then, first of all, first step, download the source code of the connector, right? Specifically, with a version that is mimics the version that you have deployed, right? Uh, and then what you can do is to do a live debugging on the connector, right? By the time you have the source code, everything becomes easier. Just use an IDE. No, actually, it's not just I use an IDE. Step number one, you have to go into the broker or function worker that you are using to deploy the connectors, and you have to enable this JDWP protocol, which is a kind of a debugging protocol native from Java, right? Uh, I'm gonna show you how, how I dump, I've done this. And then remember that I've told you that the function worker has three types of runtime, process, thread, and Kubernetes, right? So you gotta use the thread runtime to be able to actually do this debugging, right? By default, that's the, that's the gotcha. By default, Pulsar and the Pulsar worker use the process runtime. That's the default configuration. So if you're trying to do a live debugging like I'm gonna show here right now, it's not gonna work. Why? You get, you have to tweak your configuration to enable the thread runtime. And then you can simply attach your IDE to the JVM and then start your debugging. So let me show how this works and then you will you will understand better. All right, so, um, okay. Okay, so let me first check if I have a connector deployed. Probably not, but I think it's, I have a script here that basically checks the status of the connector. Let me show here this, the message. So yeah, so there's no connector. So let's do this. Let's deploy a connector. So let me execute the script sync create. What the script does is essentially deploy the connector as you can see here, right? So basically I'm calling the CLI admin URL. I'm specifying the configuration file for Elasticsearch and then specifying which topics to create. So now it is being deployed. So if I run the status again, it should be successfully deployed or something like this. Um, close this off. And uh, yep, so the connector is working. So what I'm gonna do, I have here, I, I've changed my Pulsar configuration as I mentioned before. I've came here into this file from the com folder called Pulsar env, right? And then I've changed this over here. Uh, there is this environment variable over here called Pulsar options. And then I've included this, I've exposed the JWP protocol over the port 7777, right? So the Pulsar broker that I've having on right here is already with this flag, right? And then in the function worker files, what I've done here, I've comment out, let me increase the font size so you can see, I've comment out the process runtime configuration and I have enabled the thread runtime. Right, so you gotta do this manually, unfortunately, right? So once you do this, I can, uh, I have my ID here already configured to attach to this port 777. So I'm going to do this attachment right now. So I currently have my ID attached to the 
to the broker, right, that I'm running. And I have here the source code of the Elasticsearch connector, right? So this is the code of the Elasticsearch connector. Uh, here you go. That, as you can see here, has the methods open and write. So what I'm going to do is set a breakpoint over here exactly on the first line of the write method. And I'm going to essentially send a message, a one-off. So what needs to happen, right, the IDE needs to kind of stop the execution of the connector exactly on that point that I've right here. Here we go. So let me open up right here, increase the font size so you can see it. So what I can do now is to inspect the execution step by step of the code, and then I can inspect the variables and see whatever has been kind of a, being instantiated behind the scenes by the connector, right? Most of the time, you will see problems like, uh, oh, yeah, I'm seeing here that maybe this is a comp compatibility problem, or perhaps the connector is, is, uh, is malfunctioning, right? Maybe you are dealing with a situation that you've caught that the connector was not predicting. So it is your job as a good citizen of the Pulsar community to report back to the dear friends from Pulsar, and they will be sure they're going to fix it so far. Or maybe you can proactively go there and the GitHub repository and provide a fix as well, which is basically that's the beauty of a community-driven project, right? So this is uh, possible. I'm going to resume here my debugging execution. And with that, with that, with that, right, let's go back here. I would like to wrap up this presentation. I know that we are running probably a little bit of running out of time here. Uh, according to my friend Alex, and uh, I am open to any questions that you might have, my friends. And uh, but before I didn't have the chance to say this, thank you very much for being here today, and I look forward to talk with you later in the session, either here on Slack.